What is biosyncing? By the end of this podcast, you will know all about it and you'll probably want to do it too. Hi, I'm Tony. I'm an author, presenter at Sky Sports, and years ago I went to the jungle and got ill. Very <laughs> ill. So this is my podcast adventure to find more energy. It's packed with biohacking, science, health tech, supplements, and some of the most well-known experts on the planet. This is something I spent four months of my life doing with electrodes glued to my head so that you can do a lifetime worth of meditation. Decide what you don't give a fuck about, which is something you don't care about. Some of it gets quite out there. I had some stem cells sent up to my house that I had stored, and then I injected myself with mannitol. And we even hack hangovers. Alcohol is poisonous. So is water and oxygen in the wrong dosage. So that's my podcast, Zestology. Live life with energy, vitality, and motivation. Hello again. Hope you're enjoying December and the Christmas party season is suiting you well and you'll manage to biohack your way out of a couple of very gentle hangovers or whatever's going on in your life. I mean, I don't know why I say that. I barely drink at all now. I'm such a lightweight. Um, but listen, if you are feeling a little bit lower energy than you sometimes might be in the middle of winter, then biosyncing could help you. That's what I'm talking about today on this podcast. Biosyncing is syncing with your goals and ultradian rhythm optimizing the cycles throughout the day and i discuss it today with angela foster who is a friend of mine she hosts the high performance podcast she and i were working together at the health optimization summit in june she did a brilliant presentation there as well and she is just so good and we met up about a month ago and talked biosyncing creating new habits the importance of a resilient mindset we talked about accountability in creating the new habits that you want to stick and we also talked about some things that are really on my mind at the moment histamine intolerance and my current work exploring supplements and uh, reducing em energy levels uh, when it's super stimulated and sort of boosting sort of natural energy um, and some great biohacks and uh, tweaks to your lifestyle as well now this was fun because we started recording um, at a studio on 180 strand which is where my office is and i it wasn't just for my podcast, it was for Angela's podcast as well. But, but the, the inner podcaster in me, and obviously I've worked in radio and TV for so long, I was just asking Angela loads of questions. And about halfway through, she had to say, Tony, it's not just you interviewing me this, you know, I need to ask some questions as well. So I had to step back and allow myself to be asked some questions as well. And I very much enjoyed chatting to Angela. We had a bit of lunch afterwards. And you know, I feel like that whenever I meet up with her. And I think you are going to feel like that today listening to this podcast. I hope so anyway. It's one of those inspiring ones. And I think that biosyncing is something that I sort of feel like it's so primal that a lot of biohackers do it anyway. And you may well be interested in knowing more about biosyncing with Angela Foster. Here she is. Angela, we're recording. Cool. How are you? I'm really well. It's nice to be here. It's nice to do it in person. It is really nice. Yeah. And you were just telling me before we started recording, you haven't drunk out because I was telling you I had three cocktails here yeah. on Wednesday night. Tequilas. So three tequilas. And I feel great today. So that's good. Um, what? Why haven't you drunk for ages? Yeah. So I was saying that it was a bit of an experiment. I was looking at what can I give up that I'm attached to insofar as it held more of an experience, right? So that my husband and I have always kind of laid down wine, invested in it, visited vineyards. So there's a whole kind of romantic thing around it. I don't really drink anything else than like wine. And uh, so as an experiment to see whether this whole kind of 60 day, 66 day rule around habit formation, I thought, I wonder how long it would take until at a weekend, I wouldn't think oh, it would be nice to relax together, have a chat, have a glass yeah. of wine. And um, so I was experimenting with that. And it's been quite interesting what's happened because... Um, I'd say that it was around 50 days. So I think when people look at, and you'll know more about this from your NLP work, right? But when you look at giving something up, yeah. in the beginning, that reticular activation system right at the back of the brain just keeps reminding you, doesn't it, of something you used to do. Um, so you've got to kind of like um, put in effort effectively to overcome that. And then after I'd say around 50 days, so maybe a month and a half ago, yeah. uh, those reminders just stopped even at weekend it just kind of fell away so then it was like okay this is weird now it's not quite taken 66 days i wonder what i'll do for here and i set an initial goal of 90 days just to go well beyond the 66 thinking it might take longer on people etc 
And uh, so then it just got like easier and easier. And then I got, um, I just got really even more into exercise and mm. like the fresh feeling of like weekends, waking up really early at weekends, being really consistent with my sleep schedule, which if you have a few drinks, it's much harder. Oh, consistent. definitely. Yeah. Because all your willpower goes out the window. Exactly. You know, and you stay up later. Down until one o'clock in the yeah. beginning, isn't it? Because I can have. Exactly. And then I'm going to sleep in a little bit. Or you feel dreadful if you get up at your usual time. Yeah. So um, that got really like positively addicted. There are a few things along the way that we can talk about that I had to change because uh, I did develop some bad habits. Um, and then basically now I don't know what to do because I've kind of gone, I don't know, 120 days or so. Yeah. And I've sort of developed this um, streak, which is a bit, a bit weird, of not drinking. But I don't want to, um, I don't necessarily see myself as a non-drinker. And I'm not sure I want to break the streak, if you see what I mean. So it's become a bit weird. I'm really pleased you mentioned that because, I'm, you know, I told you I'm writing this, these books at the moment. And they're all based around NLP principles, but also habit forming and persuasion principles. Because ultimately, the, the goal is that people read these books and they actually end up, you know, changing stuff. And one of the days that I've written is all about streaks. Because people place massive importance on streaks. I don't know if you've heard of the um, 75 hard challenge. Have you heard of that one? Yes. It might be based on the similar sort of thing as what you've been doing with the 66 days. 75 hard is um, you've got to do all these sort of different things. It's not based in science at all. You've got to do all these different things at once. And if you mess up a day, you've got to start from day one again. Right. And actually, the habit forming science would suggest that's not a very good way to do a challenge. Because... What's more important is resilience. And you and I have been having a little chat about addiction just before we started. And it's especially important in addiction because the recovery from addiction or any sort of habit forming is, is never really that linear. You know, you're going to have a day where you, um, I don't know, you, you're up at thrift like the morning, but you think, God, drop your son at Heathrow and you're knackered and you have a glass of wine. And it just happens sometimes. And what's more important is that the next day you wake up and you don't say, Oh, I've messed it up now. I'm going uh, to take a drink. Or or nothing. Yeah. yeah. So res I think resilience is a lot more. And of course, what most people do with the 75 hard challenge is they either, some of them who've got the willpower, like you, finish it, but a lot of others lapse on day 14 because life has got in the way and they haven't had the time to do it and they don't bother starting again. So I think, you know, being kind to yourself and being resilient and remembering that it's not you know habit forming isn't linear is more important yeah i agree with that it's interesting you say that because i think you see that a lot when we look at alcohol with dry january mm -hmm. and people just white knuckle it for 30 days but yeah. it's never changed behavior yeah so yeah so it did change behavior but inadvertently because i was like well my plan wasn't to become a non-drinker mm -hmm. uh and uh we were talking about books weren't we so i also like i've been reading and um, yeah, right okay, the well, Why not? might come back, can we? Can we put the book in yeah, because so it's obviously. relevant? Yeah. Normally I ask, what is one book you recommend? But do it out. <laughs> Let's do it now. Yeah. Um, so Ryan Holiday's latest book, Discipline yes. is Destiny. Okay. That was really interesting for me because in there he talks about abstinence. Actually, yeah. It's not like addiction, but it's almost kind of down the same thing, right? Because it is easier. 100% is easier than 90%. Yeah. Uh, which in many respects can be a good thing. But he talks about this concept, this stoic concept of temperance. And I actually think that's more valuable in life. So in reality, I mean, I say, I, I never gave up alcohol because I had a problem with alcohol. So maybe that is slightly different. Do you know what I mean? Because how could you uh, practice temperance if you did? That might be a bit harder. Yeah. I'm sure. Um, whereas for me, it was just this experiment. What would happen like for how long would my brain take before it stopped reminding me? And it just became a natural new behavior. But now it has become a natural new behavior. I'm thinking, yeah, where do I and how do I give up that streak? Because as you say, that feels like I'm not sure I want to. It's my birthday coming up. And yeah. that would be a time when usually I would have a glass or something to celebrate. And I'm thinking, I don't know if I want to break my streaks. So it's sort of a bit weird. It's sort of a bit up there. It would be interesting because you could break it very mindfully and just have a lovely glass of expensive wine. Yeah. And to see how you feel. I could. And actually, that would be like a very nice way to do it. Yeah. Really indulge with something very enjoyable. So, um, and I think the temperance thing you were talking about is very interesting because I see quite a few similarities 
between you and I in terms of, I think you're quite type A personality. You're quite driven. You know, you're obviously building this incredible business and doing so well. And I'm the same. And actually, you know, for me, biohacking is often based around doing less, switching off a bit, relaxing, because that is probably the most important thing for my health, I think. Yeah, I mean, believe for me, yeah. and the bit that I find the hardest. So it's actually really it, difficult. I'm not good at just sort of saying, oh, yeah, all right, I'll have a glass of wine to learn. Yeah. Are you good at disciplining yourself to recover? Because, like, for example, if you gave me the choice to do a workout or yoga, I'm going to pick the workout every single time. I would actually have to discipline myself right. to do something easier. Mm. So I'm, I'm kind of struggling with that now. So then I've been doing a lot of research recently into sort of flow states and creativity and this concept of having the struggle um, and then the sort of um, allowance, if you like, before you enter flow and then the recovery cycle that comes after it. Uh, And it's definitely for me, I would say, in terms of biohacking, it's the recovery that I'm really trying to prioritize now because I have to, I think, I think part of it is having three kids, two dogs, a business, you know, it kind of is all go, go, go all the time. Yeah. But I need to work that in. So with the flow states, are you using them with your, you do the research, does that go into what you do with your clients and your group as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's kind of a core concept when I talk about this concept of biosyncing is to be able to sync with your goals. But also when we look at rhythms, so obviously we look at the female menstrual cycle, but then what about also all trading rhythms? So we know like what happens in sleep is kind of mirrored by the brain during the day. So there's these 90 to 110 minute approximate cycles. Oh, yeah. How can we optimize them in the day? And what's interesting is if you're not getting enough deep sleep, actually it becomes much harder to get into flow and optimize those rhythms in the day. So the two have a knock on effect. Right, yeah. The Ultradian rhythms, I've got very into listening to Andrew Huberman's oh, yeah, work. Too. He's great, isn't he? He is. And I, I've been listening to his one on focus. And I thought it was really interesting because I was telling you before, I'm writing these books at the moment and it's, I find my limit for work is two hours a day of really deep work. Focus. Lots of work through the day, but the real deep work. And it's incredible how much I get done in those two hours. But that might sound like such a small amount of time to most people. It, what, you're running a book, you're already doing two hours a day. Yeah, and I get a lot done in those two hours, but my brain can't handle any more. Yeah. And actually, he talks about that as well with these old tradian rhythms. Yeah. So what are they exactly? These are just um, rhythms that happen during the day that are around approximate 90 minutes, I think. Mm. And so if you time them, because I was going to ask you, if you're looking at two hours, do you break that up or can you go straight for two hours? I break it up. You do? Even two hours on its own is too long. I was going to say, it seems too long. Yeah. How would you break that up then? So what I do is I'm... And I've developed quite a nice system for it. I, I've, I've looked into all the apps. There's some great apps like Screen Z and Forest. Have you heard of Forest? No. This is what all the kids are using. Your kids are probably doing it in a couple of years when they're sort of doing GCSEs and A-levels. You click a button and it grows a tree on an app on your phone. And if you leave the app to go and do anything else for the next hour, the tree withers and dies. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> and like that, it's so oh, well, that would keep me going, yeah. Yeah. So I think it's not that, um, but what I've done and works well is starting a timer. I use Trello for all my sort of to-do lists and organizing, starting a timer on there when I'm doing deep work and then stopping it the moment I come out of deep work and then just making myself start. And then over the course of the day, as long as that deep work counter has gone over two hours, that's good. Okay. So then you'll take a small break and come back to it. It just depends. I mean, look, you know, came to meet you here at 12 today and um, some unexpected childcare this morning. So did half an hour's writing on the tube. Okay. And really deep work really deep as work. well. Yeah, you can do it anywhere when you can get in the zone. Oh, that's the thing. Yeah. And then click the timer off when you arrived and then I'll click it on again later on. Yeah. So, yeah, wherever. Just whenever. I mean, you, you have to be a bit flexible when you've got a lot of things going on in you your do. day. But I'm just so fascinated by this old trading and cycles thing. It's just not possible to do that level, that quality of work when you go so deeply. But what I wanted to ask you about is, you said before we started that we might get a chance to chat about histamine and histamine intolerance. And obviously this is my side project. People have listened to this podcast and my podcast and know that, you know, I sort of bang on about histamine all the time. And I've been looking recently into supplementary ways to just reduce that real type A sort of stimulated energy based on genes. And it's all quite complicated and it's way above my pay grade. 
But this is interesting. Yeah, I was just a, kind of to to well, reduce type A energy. Um, to reduce type A energy, yeah, exactly. Because you know, a lot of people with histamine intolerance do have very type A personalities for various reasons. They, their whole sort of stimulatory, their whole nervous system is set on high all the time, and what they need to do is sort of calm it down. When you have a look at the genes, there's one a gene called DAO or DAO, which is particularly important with histamine. There's another one called MAO, M-A-O. There's MAO A and MAO B, known as the warrior gene, as in fighter, but also anxious. <laughs> and that one did describe me, but I mean, not, not a fighter, but just, you know, some type A personality. Yeah. And that is something that's really important in the histamine and histidine pathway. And my MAO genes don't work very so I've been looking at taking a lot of riboflavin over the last few days. B, vitamin B2. Okay. Uh, this is something new. So like, and this is not help? medical advice. Let's put it that way. I mean, not feeling great. You know, because of the, the whole idea is that it, it um, if you don't have enough mal uh, gene energy, you're not uh, processing dopamine and other amines in the body, serotonin in the stomach, and therefore... Your hormones are just wildly out of control and you, you just over dopamine all the time. So by having enough riboflavin, you can reduce some of that energy and you get the histamine pathways working right. That's what I'm working on. That's very interesting. Yeah. And so you're with this, you're prone more to anxiety, are you? Oh, I mean Oh yeah. Yeah. I mm. so but but also just prone to being a real high achiever. So a lot of people a lot of people who have a compromised mal A or mal B pathway tend to be high achievers because they their their dopamine and their serotonin is just going to absolute overdrive and their amines in the gut aren't being processed sufficiently. So one so I'll, do you know what? Next time you see me, I'll probably be living on a beach and I won't be writing any more books and I won't be recording podcasts. <laughs> All that dopamine want to be soaked up out of a nice healthy balance. <laughs> and just be chilling out. Yeah. And with you, I was curious, like, because um, my listeners would be very interested in this. What are you, the symptoms that you had that led you to understand you had histamine intolerance? Oh, I mean, it was like a sort of lifelong journey, really. That's why I do this podcast. The only sort of ill for so long and didn't really know. Had a big crash like you as well, but mainly just unexplained gut symptoms. And the whole thing about histamine intolerance is it's so random. You know, avocados are bad, but celery is good. Try explaining that. You know, I mean, it's just it's just so hard. Um, and um, I just found that, like, one day I'd be absolutely fine. The next day I wasn't, and there was no rhyme or reason to it. And histamine intolerance was the bottom last thing on the list. After trying everything. Yeah, because it was so confusing. I couldn't work it out. Um, eventually tried that and started to feel better within about three hours. <laughs> From a low histamine diet. Oh, my God, yeah, like, so quick. Wow. Yeah. And did it affect cognition quite significantly? Absolutely, and it still does. I mean, it, it, again, you know, we talk about linear recoveries. I still get crashes. The day before, the day we went to Glastonbury this summer, actually, um, I had a real flare-up. I just couldn't think straight, couldn't drive. Faith had to drive us down to Glastonbury, <laughs> just lay in the back of the car. Managed to get over it with a load of charcoal tablets and, you know, some good company for a few days. But um, it really does affect cognition, yeah. To get like really bad tra- brain fog. No, no, no. It's, it's more than that. It's like talk about the the um the gut brain connection. It's a real depression actually. Is it? I'm really depressed. Oh, that's hard. Yeah. yeah. As someone who struggled with it, that is really tough. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Depression's a bit strong actually. Just feeling really low. Not depression, just very low. And gutted that I've been trying to figure this out for so long and I've had a naps. Yeah, that's hard. So, and, and, and working with good practitioners who understand this stuff is so important and histamine intolerance practitioners are a few and far between very few and it's such a specialist area that's the thing yeah um, there's probably lots of people that have it right that don't really realise yeah uh, in all honesty and uh, my practitioner you know she's r- one of the best Caroline Sherlock she's called and um, he, I mean, still it's taken us quite a long time to unravel it all and figure it all out you know. So now, if you get an attack like that and it comes on, yeah. you know what triggered it? Because you're so good, aren't you, with your... No, which is weird. I had... If Monday, where is it? Monday, I felt a bit dodgy and I wasn't quite sure why. And Faith was like, yeah, but you did go out at the weekend. and you, Oh, that's right. I was in Valencia last week and my friend has a mouldy flat. <laughs> I could smell it. Could so smell one, it. one of the things about histamine thoracity is your, your, your sense of smell 
it's just massively switched off. I've got a really acute you- sense. Oh, yeah. Like, annoyingly so. Then I can smell gas or I can smell mold and other people won't even notice it. And I could smell the moment I walked to this flat, I was like, it smells damp in here, mate. He was like, does it? <laughs> so I slept with all the windows and the doors open, but, you know, I felt really groggy after day three. Yeah, I can imagine that. It. Well, I, we had an interesting experience with mold. We think is mold in our mold house. Um, basically, my son, so he was my middle one, was born on like the ninety eighth percentile. So he was destined to be pretty tall. And then when he, by the time he was three, he'd had so many infections they removed his tonsils. And they were looking at his adenoids. They said they're small. He couldn't breathe through his nose. And there was a pipe outside. We couldn't see anything on the inside of the house, but it was a house on clay at the bottom of, um, on the back of a golf course, came down the hill. And there was a very elderly couple next door who had a well, had a well, and they were not taking care of it. It kept overflowing and then flooding into the garden, which was making our house yeah. wetter and wetter. Right. And just at the time, after it was actually after we'd agreed all the sale, I remember seeing a small amount of mold. And I was like, that's weird. We've never had mold in this property before. Anyway, we moved and... Um, and basically, we got into a new house, and within three to four weeks, he literally just slept and slept and slept, completely could breathe through his nose, no problems at all, because they talked about doing surgery to open up his airways, and I was like, no more surgery. Surely this will correct the growth, because they said his adenoids are fine, but actually his tubes are really small. He was, he'd was he been like moved down from the A team to the B team because he wasn't big enough, like when he was playing and rugby and things. Anyway. Within about, he already killed me if he hears me talking about me. Yeah. Within about three or four weeks, he's suddenly breathing through his nose, uh, completely fine, sleeping and sleeping and sleeping. Oh my God, did he grow? Really? It went from he dropped to like the 75th centile. He's now back up at the 98th. Super tall. It was it, nothing short of extraordinary. Um, wow. And I think that's where in that house, you know, I had bronchitis, pneumonia, I was hospitalized with pneumonia. And that must have, yeah, we just didn't know at the time. Shocking, isn't it, the impact it has? For some people. This podcast is brought to you by Bond Charge and their blue light blocking glasses. A fantastic bit of kit. I'm so pleased to have teamed up with a company that sells the best blue blocking glasses because, let's be honest, this month you're probably getting a lot of late nights and your sleep is a little bit disrupted. And their blue light glasses can help you with just getting a little bit more circadian friendly. You know, whether it's you're looking at a computer so too much, so you get headaches and sore eyes, or you you have a bit of light sensitivity, so you get migraines and stress, or the sleep is an issue, and I hear you, in December, and you've got poor sleep and fatigue and low energy, or maybe even jet lag, their blue light blocking and computer glasses and light sensitivity glasses are fantastic, and I've been trying them out, and I can say two things. Firstly... In fact, I'm going to say three things. Firstly, they work great um, and they're very stylish. Secondly, I think they're redder. They block out more of the blue light than any of the other blue light glasses that I've ever tried. They definitely, they are 100%. They really block it out. It's great. The third thing I'd say is they're very comfortable. They've they've obviously put a lot of thought into making these com- these uh, comfortable glasses. And, um, well, since I've been wearing them, I've uh, been sleeping a little bit better and it's really nice to wear in the evening. Watch a bit of Netflix in bed or on the sofa with some Bond Charge uh, blue light glasses. Um, It's definitely worth going to check them out. I'm really delighted to have partnered with Bond Charge. And I really think that it is so on brand for Zestology, improving your sleep, improving your circadian rhythm, getting a little bit more primal and going to Bond Charge and using the coupon code TONY20 to save 20%, not just on their blue light glasses, but on everything. Okay, so they've got the computer glasses, the light sensitivity glasses, the uh, blue light blocking glasses, but they've also got infrared light. They've got other sleep devices and stuff for your sleep as well. It's a brilliant, it's almost like somebody has said, we're going to take all the infrared and blue blue light blocking glasses out there and we're going to create one site for biohackers. You're going to love it. B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E dot com. Use the code tony20 at bondcharge.com they ship all over the world um, and they've even got emf devices that's why it's such a biohacker site over the coming months we're going to look at some of those sites as well but uh, bondcharge.com use the code tony20 now back to the show beth o'hara is a, a 
brilliant histamine expert and uh, master cell and histamine she's very strong on and I've, I've interviewed her a couple of times on this podcast and she says that um her husband goes mad because when they go to hotel rooms she can instantly walk in and she's so finely tuned to it. i mean her, she's had real issues with histamine in the past and still does but she can tell instantly if it's somewhere she's going to be able to stay in or not and if not she'll just walk straight out it's not just mold it's uh, perfumed like detergents floor cleaners um and i feel the same as well if i'm standing at puzzle it's got really strong perfume now oh i don't really like it you know or like um strong floor cleaner or like uh dettol or something like that you can't I really don't like it you can sense dettol yeah so. when I, I mean obviously everyone could smell dettol but you but i but i just don't like but the mold that is fascinating yeah, it's really interesting what happened there. Yeah. Just to see the difference and how much like the classic medical professionals were looking at, you know, it must be this, must be this. Yeah. Um, but we didn't have any idea. It didn't, as I say, it wasn't showing any signs you couldn't smell it. It's not like there was mold in the bathrooms or anything. Yeah. But we could see that over time there was a degree of flooding in the garden. I think where the house, the property wasn't was on clay. It just wasn't draining. And this had affected him and and me. But not everyone's affected, right? It's the rest of the family are okay. Yeah. So that's what makes it so weird. And I think that's what often makes these things really hard to diagnose as well. Well, yeah. And, it, you know, I've spoken before. We've got a lovely shed at the end of our garden, which has been converted into a home office. And every time I sit in there, I feel ill. Literally every time. And it doesn't happen instantly. It happens the next day. So it took me a while to work out. My wife, she's in there right there working. She's fine. <laughs> so, yeah. And there's not there's not mold in there. Oh, I think. Oh, you think there is? Yeah, yeah. We, it was built before we moved in, uh, and okay. I know it's hollow underneath because there used to be foxes in there until we managed to get them out and block it up. Um, so it's hollow underneath. I think it gets down for winter, and there's just a load of standing water in there. And then you put the heater on, it just heats up all this sort of moldy, dank sort of the air, and it's all brilliant. I must feel it. Have you tried um, Altos? Have you used Altos? This is a gadget that you're a bit of tech that you can get out and it measures air quality. Oh no, I have. In fact, I was sent one. Yeah. And I did it in the. I did it in fact in a tube here in London. I was out right. like this a few years ago. Yeah. And it literally went on red alert. Did it? Yeah. Well, as a, it was um, on the central line. The other lines were actually cleaner because I was surprised initially. Yeah. At how clean the air seemed to be on the tube in London. Until I was on the central line, and then it just this thing, and everyone was like looking. It was like going off, sounding an alarm. Right, yeah, no, that's but, uh, yeah, and it doesn't measure mold because obviously we can talk about mold, but it measures CO two quality, also measures temperature, sound, decibels, and something else. Um, but what I think is really interesting about the the air quality is, you know, CO two is sort of is proven that if your CO two levels get really low, which is obviously what you found in the central line, then your cognition isn't as good, your brain doesn't work as well, you got start to get really sleepy. And I too have measured it all over the place in all this tube and I've sort of found middling results. The worst place I've ever found using it by a long way is this office. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. where are we are now? Yeah. Wow. It's because it's all... Because it's aircon, right? It's not, it's the windows are not... It's interesting because it's an old 70s building that's been refurbished. I wonder if that's got something to do with it. It's quite old. It's aircon, the windows don't actually open. And I mean, I feel great here. I never feel, I never feel tired. I work really well here. But it's always on about two out of ten. Interesting. Yeah. I am. I must say, I'm a big proponent of like open windows. Well, that's why I'm at home. Always want open windows. Yeah. yeah. I just love for like cool air yeah. through as much as I can. Do you do that at night as well? Quite often. Yeah. Yeah. And what are the sort of obviously? So you work one on one with clients, and if it, are we releasing this podcast together? By the way. We can just the class class. Or, you've kind of interviewed me. I need to do you as well. I, think yeah. I was trying to ask you some questions oh, yeah, there, but you yeah, yeah. asking me. Yeah. Sorry, that's I sort of forgot that you were interviewing me as well. Come on, ask me some questions. I'm going to ask you some questions. So uh, I want to come to the books, but I guess I always like asking you what fun new kind of biohacking, either technology yeah. or supplements you're playing with. Because every time I speak to you, you're doing something new. I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's funny, obviously, the B2. The riboflake yeah. is the one that I've been playing with in the last couple of weeks and I'm really excited by. Um, but then it's interesting that you mentioned that since I got the Altox and I started thinking a bit more about air quality, I have been sleeping with a window open at night. Free biohack. It's hardly groundbreaking, is it? But I just sleep so much better. Um, and then in the terms of the habit forming, 
you know, in terms of starting new habits that stick, I thought about that so much. And James Clear's book is a great one to read. Yes, have it. Very good. Yeah. And then um, another person who's brilliant is Robert Cialdini, who, who's um, written these books around persuasion. And he's got six laws of persuasion. And one of them is just commitment. The more that you've got a public commitment to doing something, the more likely you are to do it. And I know I feel better when I exercise a lot. You mentioned that earlier, and I always do. So one of the things that's really revolutionized my exercise is having a WhatsApp group with my wife and just writing the exact amount of minutes that we exercise for each day in it and then adding it up at the end of the month. Oh, so, so it almost she's your accountability partner that you do my accountability buddy, but it does two things. Firstly, it keeps me accountable. Secondly, I'm very competitive. We've already spoken about the time game. Mm-hmm. I want to beat last month. So uh, you were going to say I want to beat my wife. Yeah, I think you do. Well. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Nat and I are very competitive. It's quite funny. Yeah. So we have one for meditation and we have one for exercise. And it just genuinely keeps me so accountable. It's like a separate WhatsApp group. And we're just writing in our minutes there each day. And it's the number of minutes as opposed to the frequency. So you could do a really long workout and make up some extra minutes or just frequency apply when you're measuring this as well. No. Um, she measures frequency as well. So she, but I don't. <laughs> so it should be like, oh, 29 days out of You're right. Yeah, I just did a yeah. six hour hike and. Uh, oh, yeah. Because I did. I threw a load of minutes. I did the Three Peaks Yorkshire Challenge in, in May, which was, by the way, like the best. Was it amazing? Year. It was so good. And I said to Faith after, so I was like, am I allowed to put in 10 hours here? And she was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so my scores were serious <laughs> tied in May. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really like that. And I, you know, put so much time into thinking around behavioral science. Um, because all of this stuff is sort of, there's all sorts of scientific studies that prove that this stuff works, commitment, accountability, um, and, you know, James, what I like about James Clear is that he references a lot of science in his books as well. And I think that's definitely the way to go. You know, I mean, one of the things about NLP is it's brilliant to be able to use NLP in conjunction with studies to show that it works. Yeah. Yeah. When you've got the science to back it up. Yeah. How would you, when you're looking at NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, because it really helps to change your beliefs, right, and your view of the world, how would you say it differs from something like CBT? I remember doing a lot of CBT when I was struggling with depression. Yeah. And trying to change my thought patterns and analyze, like, were they really true? What could the alternative be? What would you say is, like, the critical difference? Um... Firstly, I don't really know that much about CBT, so it's quite difficult to answer that question. But one of the interesting things around CBT is that it is mainly a therapy, whereas NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, is used in all sorts of areas. It's used in communication, sales, um, sports psychology, therapy as well. Not in sales, actually. He's a lot of sales. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the linguistics part of it is fantastic. I absolutely love it. And uh, do I ever tell you about when I first started learning NLP and I was a radius presenter? And I knew very little about the techniques, but the person who was teaching me said, look, the really important thing is to practice these techniques as much as possible. Practice, practice, practice. So I, um, I thought, well, I've got the perfect place to try it. I'll try it on my radio show. And I just used all these techniques as much as possible. I was going, I was about a five month course and I was learning all these techniques and I was going to my radio show the next day and just layering it all on and not doing a very good job. Then the boss called me into his office one day and I thought he'd rumbled me. I thought he sort of noticed that I'd used some sort of complex equivalence on my show. And he said, Tony, I don't know what you've done, but your listening figures have gone through the roof. <laughs> And it was it was it was incredible, and you know I I, I wasn't an. Actor. What were you doing? What what was different? Were you teaching it, or what was different? I was using techniques to make people feel better about listening, um, to uh, listen for longer, and to to attract new listeners to the podcast as well. So I was using all sorts of sensory language techniques and presuppositions, and um, the, all the various persuasive techniques that you can use in terms of. Um, that uh, NLP and I was trying everything really but even just the sensory language stuff is, is just so effective and I ended up having more listeners than the breakfast show I was on the drive time show <laughs> seriously yeah. that's amazing yeah so I can't remember the original question 
Well, I was just looking at, yeah, like things like the difference between NLP, but you're right, it goes a lot. I mean, you're the expert in it, but it goes a lot, a lot broader. It's definitely something I want to kind of Is get it? to more. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think so, because I think when you start to like realize how much you can, to be able to influence other people, right, you need to be able to influence yourself um, first, I think. Yeah. And uh, that was um, something that I sort of really focused on to influence my own thoughts initially. Yeah. I just find it fascinating looking at all like Tony mm-hmm. Robbins' work as well. Um, so Tony Robbins is like it's very NLP based mm. and in fact he learned NLP yeah. the guy who invented it as did I um, but the one thing I mean I don't want to put you off learning NLP because I think you should but I sort of feel like it's a, it's, it's a great it's not the only thing you want to do with people and therefore it would be a nice compliment to everything else you do mm. but it doesn't have to be the only thing and for anyone I would say like you know I sort of have trained to the highest level in NLP but it's not the only thing I use I've trained in at EFT as well and modern factor coaching but also just the biohacking stuff it all works really nicely together mm. makes it actually strict. yeah because it's kind of mind body spirit optimization isn't it yeah that's yeah. the thing so something I'm about to try should I tell you yeah have you tried C60 I'm trying the ESS60 oh my goodness just being no 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 so here we go so this C60 uh, has had studies where it's improved life expectancy in rats by 90% it's quite what? scary, but it does oh in humans, God. isn't it? Oh, that. Like 160, 155, 160. Perfect. Yeah, well, I've just done a podcast, actually. It's not not out yet, all about this. Uh, and my first question was, how can you persuade me that actually I would want to live that long? Because at the yeah. moment, none of it looks very attractive. Do you know what I mean? If you look at, ultimately, I think no matter how long you live, there seems to be a very small section of the population who literally live super well into old age, go to sleep one night and don't wake up. Yeah. Like, that would be amazing. We, yeah. Usually, however long, really, we, I feel like we're postponing disease, but ultimately it comes at some point. It does. And I'm not sure I want to be super old. So that's never really been a thing for me. So I, when, when I was talking to him about it, it was like, how can you persuade me, uh, you know, that this would be necessarily a really good thing? But apparently there are also lots of benefits with it. I'm just about to start the experiments. So we'll have to do a plan yeah. to be, uh, around sleep as well. The only thing you can take in the morning that will actually then improve your sleep substantially at night. Uh, so it's quite interesting. And ESS60 is the form that is suitable for humans and children. It. So it's a fullery. Like, this is going to go with chemistry that I don't know about. It's they not on a boil. Yeah, so I don't know the technicalities. Yeah. It's, a, it's known as a yeah. fullerene and I think for has to do with carbon, yeah. but it's just been, um, I think a lot of people were taking it when they shouldn't have been initially uh, because it wasn't in a human consumption form and the year ESS60 is. So this has just arrived for me now, for me to experiment. But it sounds quite so. My natural disposition is, I'm going to be sceptical until I've, and it sounds quite salesy. Hey, it's going to, you know, but but if, it, if actual studies show that it's increased life expectancy and wrapped by 90%, that's worth and do it further and mystery games are going to kill you in the process and shorten your life and turn <laughs> exactly well it's a bit like looking at spermidine right i haven't oh, yeah. really gone down that road yet but then i was when i was That's researching it recently that yeah. the whole hair thing was appealing to me as yeah. well and skin and all those benefits in addition to long after you've yeah. tried it yeah and they're one of my partners at the moment on the podcast i mean it's really good spermidine life dot us um use the code tony 20 to get 20 percent off i'll re- it's really, really good for longevity, as the science shows. But the immediate sort of life-giving effect of better skin, health, and nails as well is significant. Is that what? You, so, what did you notice when you started? Um, I listen. I've had sort of. I don't pay quite as much attention to the quality of my skin as my wife does. <laughs> <laughs> and, really and is she taking? Yeah, it as well? she okay. Yeah, she thinks it's great, yeah. and and I do as well. But um, she's. As big, if not a bigger fan than me. I really like it for sleep and definitely noticed a difference in my sleep. Um, and that's one of the really interesting things that I've spoken about in this podcast. The science around sleep and spermidine is way more limited. But it's because it's so emerging. This, you know, I mean, there's loads of science around spermidine, but the science around sleep and spermidine, there's not that much. There's a study on flies and a study on a couple of animal studies. But anecdotally everyone's saying i have this spermidine and then i sleep really well so it's one of those ones where you say oh, well actually there isn't a science on that one but people sleep better so 
and I'm still doing my research on it as well. I mean, it's like I, I just spoke to one of the guys from Spermidine Life a couple of weeks ago, and it is such an emerging area. Um, but still with enough science, I think, to make it worthwhile giving you guys to. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's one of um, the things I think Sandra Kaufman was mentioning in her Kaufman protocols. Oh, yeah. Longevity as well. And yeah. Uh, I was looking, no, but that's some, someone I do. Have you? That's someone I'll have you at a moment. Oh, I'm oh, interesting. I'll introduce you. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah. Um, Shall we wrap this up and go and get a bit of lunch? Let's go and get I'm, I'm sorry that I basically interview you more than you interview That's all right. We can do another one on Zoom and I can interview Well, no, what we'll do is, uh, oh, yeah, we could do that. Well. Oh, we could do it here. But, um, well, actually, or we'll meet here again and then we'll go have a cocktail afterwards. You can have your first drink. Get <laughs> 120 <laughs> days. Break it. Uh, I'm, I've got a question that I always ask you always ask people but if you want to make it a joint podcast you can ask me the same question afterwards okay so the question is you've already answered the book question but what is one tip for living with more energy and vitality to live in alignment that's the thing i practice every day okay. and i actually give myself a score at the end of it so i think when you really know what you want to do and you're super clear on your goals and you know what your values are so like family is a big one for me and making a difference in the world so it's like are those two things lining up? Because often you can sacrifice one and develop the other. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I give myself an alignment score, an, an honest one out of 10, and say, did I live in alignment today? And yeah. I think if I can score highly on a daily basis, then I feel each day I'm heading in the right direction. Brilliant. You're so like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a trap. I think to most people, that would be like, oh my God, she gives us screen moments. But I'm like, oh, that's quite yeah, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. They probably think I'm crazy now, but I do. Anyway, it's well, something I find help for it. <laughs> maybe other people will, maybe yeah. they won't. What's your favourite book then, Tony? My favourite book? Mm. Um, I love Josh Waitzkin's The Art of Learning, which is Great excellent. Book. Yeah, and he was a you know six-year-old chess prodigy and then became a, a Tai Chi Taekwondo expert as an adult as well. And it's all about the similarities between learning to play chess at the top level and taekwondo and doing anything yeah i love it yeah, it's a great and then one of the things i've been looking at recently is that's about i interviewed matt walker and he said oh like you know the sleep you get early in the evening is better quality than sleep later in the evening so just going to bed a bit earlier especially when you've got a three-year-old who likes to wake up in the middle of the night yeah, really makes a massive difference um so that's so that's just something i'm working on like a regular 10 10 o'clock 10 past 10 bedtime it feels so lame when you've watched 20 minutes of a film and then you've got to say, oh, it's bedtime. But, you know, it's, 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 it's just worth the discipline, I think. I've been actually trying to nudge my, my teenage children a little bit earlier. And there's always that friction, right, in teenage years because they naturally want to go to bed later. Yeah. Uh, so we've been kind of working on that. And I think I'm actually, funnily enough, making a little bit of progress. Really? Because that's the biggest thing is, you know, yeah. if you hit that point where do you really want to, them to be up? They're not an age where you want them to be up beyond yeah. you. Because if I could, I'd go to bed at half past nine. That's actually a little bit early for a teenage boy. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so you know, we have to balance it out. Yeah. And so I don't actually, we, I tend to, for me, it's about 10, 10, 30, but I would, I'm such an early riser. Mm. I'm constantly, I would say, in a little bit of a sleep deficit, which I don't want to be. Right. Um, so... Well, I don't feel in a sleep deficit, but, but I early. probably am. Yeah, we can't probably about quarter to five. Would you like to sleep more? Um, I probably would like to sleep about another half an hour, I'd say. Look at the histamine. Histamine levels highest early in the morning. Interesting. Yeah, they fluctuate. That's why it's really hard to test with histamine. Like, you can go and get tests that measure the histamine in your body, but your histamine levels fluctuate from day to day, from week to week, certainly throughout your cycle, they'll be different at different yeah. times of your cycle. Of course, yeah. um, they'll be higher in the early morning than they will be in the afternoon. They'll be higher if you had a banana the night before compared to if you had an apple. There's so many things that really, it's just very hard to test for histamine intolerance. But, you know, one of the things is different time of day is massive. And I often wake up with a blocked up nose at five o'clock in the morning, but I won't have one at five o'clock in the afternoon. That's really interesting. I know. More to explore. More to explore. Um, so, thank you for letting me interview. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have asked you a very much. Uh, I think it's been more of a chat. I think we turned it around. I think it's been a bit more. Do you know, if you want, I can edit it so that the bits of you asking me questions is at the front of your interview. Can you? Yeah. It's very clever. Yeah.
Is that you that's going to do that? Or you're uh, to... Well, I've got an editor, but I can do it. I worked in radio for 10 years. I think. That's very clever. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. All right. Thanks for doing this. And um, what's your website again? My website yeah. is Angela Foster Performance. Yeah. I want it just before you arrived, actually, just really? checking it out. Yeah, it's really just... Reset. Yeah, just it's so so good everything you're doing, honestly. And like, I know you've got the, the, this group where you work with people. Obviously, you work one-on-one, -on -one, but you work with people on the group. Yeah, I don't work very much one-on-one. -on -one. I take yeah. like very few yeah. annual clients. Um, so I don't do much of that. I tend to work in, in groups. Brilliant. And now, yeah, it's my thing is kind of coaching, training people to coach my methodology into the biosyncing, which yeah. is new, which is cool. Oh, it's really cool. Well, I, I think a 10 book series on biosyncing is the way forward. I think it should be. And I'll be the one to help you do it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and where can people find more about you? Oh, yeah. It's you a, have an amazing. Yes. Um, TonyWriter.com and also HistamineTolerance.net, which is my side project. But it's just growing. It's a big side project. Yes, this, I mean, it's, it's not like I don't have aspirations doing the world's top histamine expert. It's just a side project. But it's really fun. I'm a journalist and I'm really interest, interested in health. And it's a it's a good way of combining those two two passions with something that definitely impacts me. Because when I think of something like, do you know what? I could take some vitamin B2 and, and that might help. I put it on an Instagram and 12,000 people give me responses. <laughs> that's just, you know, from a purely selfish perspective, that's great. So. Yes, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. All right, we'll wrap it up. Lovely to see you and we'll record again soon. Likewise. This podcast is brought to you by Bon Charge. And uh, just before I tell you about them, thank you very much to Angela Foster for coming on the podcast. Uh, really enjoyed that. I know she's into all the sort of things that Bon Charge do, like blue light blocking, um, infrared light and that sort of thing as well. But I think my favourite products from Bon Charge are their blue light glasses. And if you want to uh, get involved with them, they've got computer glasses, light sensitivity glasses and blue light blocking glasses as well. And really, if you're sort of struggling with sleep or you get a bit of digital eye strain or you get headaches, this is the company for you and the product for you. They come in non-prescription, prescription and reading options. They ship all over the world. They have glasses for every need and they look good as well. Um, and I think, you know, I think style is something that has been missing in blue light blocking glasses and that is solved by Bond Charge. So you can go to bondcharge.com, use the coupon code TONY20 to save 20%. It's a brilliant discount. Um, and that's a proper meaty discount, isn't it? If you go to bondcharge.com, use the coupon code TONY20. And when you're there, have a look at two things. The, things that the, the, the two things that I really like for them are um, their blue light blocking glasses, which you would put on, I would put on an hour or two before bed, and I'm sure you do the same thing. Um, and also the computer glasses, which I'm finding is really helping with digital eye strain. And I've done a lot of work on digital eye strain for my new book, Stop Scrolling, which is actually out now. I've not really mentioned it yet because it's been a very soft launch. But my new book is out and there's a whole section on digital eye strain. And there is an absolute epidemic of it. It's unbelievable how this has taken off. More and more people and more and more children are having issues with their eyes earlier. And it's because of, they think, computers and screens. And that is why computer glasses, uh, glasses while you're on your laptop, and let's face it, most of us spend most of the day on our laptops or our screens or our phones or watching the TV or whatever it might be, that'll help you with the eye strain. So, Tony20, go to bondcharge.com, B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E.com, and let me know how you get on by the way they do easy returns and exchanges as well and they ship worldwide that is it for this week's podcast do you know what next week is it's my review of the year show always my favorite podcast of the year my podcast editor steve it's probably his least favorite podcast for the year because i <laughs> what i'm going to be doing over the next week or so is going through every podcast and finding all my favorite bits from the year and then steve has to put it all together so steve love you mate thanks for that and uh, as always really appreciate it and that is coming next week until then have a great week thank you to angela and see you soon